This is Cricket? Yeah. I like the name. <laughs> People either love it or they hate it. Yeah, yeah, no, I like it. It's the first Cricket I've, I've worked with. Um, before we get started, we put on the website on the consultation form, but we start recording training sessions and sessions of consults. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. Um, so it looks like you're looking for um, general obedience. Yeah. Some like more off leash type stuff. Yeah. Okay. I would like to walk him off leash and know that he's not him and Chasing okay. The and then you've done some basic training already? Yeah. Uh, he, clicker his base? recall's not very good, but it's okay if he's not distracted. Okay. Like, he won't listen to me at a dog park, but like, sure. he'll listen to me at home. I gotcha. <laughs> and then uh, what what training have you done yourself? Um, we've done sit, lay down, like go to your spot, stay, like wait at crosswalks. Mm -hmm. um, what else has he done? Um, that's, that's really good. Okay. How old is he? He's uh, eight months. Eight months. Yeah. And you've had him since he was two months? Three months. Three months. Yeah. Five months. Okay. He's got an interesting coat. <laughs> He's half Pyrenees. Yeah, I saw and half Shepherd. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah. Very interesting. Um, before reaching out, did you book your, uh, I'm sorry, did you uh, read on our methods that we use and then the yeah. tools that we use? Mm -hmm. So we use prong collar, knee collar. Mm -hmm. Not so much prong collar anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't have an issue with prong collar. Uh, it's a great tool. I just find it requires a bit more technical skill for the owner. Yeah. Um, for them to learn, whereas a remote collar, it's more, uh, it's less for, for them, but they'll get the same level of training, if not better. Okay. Plus, with prong collar, if we remove the leash and the dog is off leash to get a dog park, mm -hmm. we no longer have means of reliable communication either. Yeah. Okay. So, remote collar is always my go to tool once a, a puppy hits six months. Mm -hmm. So, um, if we train a puppy at my facility under two months, from two months to six months, it's clicker training, you know, basic mm -hmm. uh, obedience, potty training type stuff. Yeah. But once they hit six months, uh, dogs tend to treat their puppies as adult dogs. Uh -huh. So then I train them uh, to an adult level at six months. Okay. So they're at that age, typically people are also fed up enough with their puppy that they're like, I need something that works and they're ready to like graduate to a tool like prong or e-collar. Yeah, okay? that makes sense. Um, do you have any understanding of what an e-collar is? Um, kind of. I met a lady at the dog park who was using one with her dog. Okay. And it was like a, um, there's like a beep option uh -huh. when they are not paying attention to you, I guess. Uh -huh. And then the second one was like a buzz. Okay, like a vibration? Yeah. Yep. So uh, some models have a, a what's called a sound or a beep, uh, a vibration, and then there's the stim. The model that I use just has a uh, vibration and a stim, but we don't use like the beep or the vibration uh, to get the dog's attention. Um, one, because people tend to use that more as a warning. And in my experience, it teaches dogs that they can ignore a set number of times before they have to actually complete the task because they know the, the stim is going to happen. So if we do beep, buzz, stim, the dog goes, I can ignore the beep, I can ignore the buzz, and then the stim is going to happen. Mm -hmm. So now we create a delay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, we train uh, purely using the stim. The only time I ever use the vibration is to see if the collar is actually turned on because sometimes it dies yeah. or like the owner forgot to turn it on uh, or if we have um, a deaf dog that we're working with because obviously with the deaf dog we don't have any kind of uh, means of sound communication so we'll use the vibration to like let them know something's going to happen and then train everything after that okay so uh, the e-collar the technology itself is um, a miniaturized TENS unit are you familiar with TENS therapy? Have you ever been to a chiropractor physical therapist? Uh, you ever seen on YouTube like those videos where they uh, recreate labor contraction pains in men? Yeah. Have you seen that? I haven't seen it, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah. So it's a machine. It's called a TENS unit. And they take these like circles that are tied to a line or not tied, but there's wires coming out of them. Mm -hmm. And they place them like on, on, the, on the stomach of the guy mm -hmm. and they'll turn it on and it starts to contract the muscles. Yeah. And obviously labor contraction pains are very uncomfortable and painful that they go very high up on the uh, on the machine which to, to mimic that intensity okay e-collar is the same technology so a lot of people think that e-collar is like electrocution or that they're like shocking their dog and that's incorrect it's like uh, vibration. uh it's a muscle stimulator okay. so if um actually i think i have one with me what's up buddy All right, so this is an e collar. So it's a muscle stimulator, and it's only stimulating the muscle that it's making contact with. Okay, 
So here, if I place this on my thumb, I can feel this already. Mm -hmm. I'm at 24. Mm -hmm. This goes to 127. Oh, so you can adjust it. You can keep it low. Correct. It too. Yeah, so this goes in increments of 1, 0 to 127. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to a higher level here. So this is 36. See that twitch in my thumb there? Mm -hmm. That's involuntary. That's the machine doing the twitch there. So okay. I have it placed on my muscle, and I'm at 36 out of 127. And due to the level of the collar, it's causing my thumb to move. Okay. So it's not like it's not painful. It's like a, it grabs their attention. Uh, yes and no. The higher we go, the more uncomfortable it becomes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if I'm at 127, it's going to be painful. It's going to be uncomfortable. Okay. Uh, every dog is different. Uh, every dog's sensitivity level is different. Um, just like every human's sensitivity level is different. So like I had a guy, he was an older gentleman. I think like he was like, like in his sixties or something. Yeah. And he wanted to feel the collar. And I feel this as low as like 15, 10. Okay. He didn't feel till like we hit 60 or 70, but most likely because like nerves and stuff, uh, dying his, his, uh, before he could actually feel it, it was a much higher level. Yeah. Okay. Now 70 for me, I'd be like, ah, that's pretty uncomfortable. But for him, he's like, oh yeah, I feel it. Like it was like barely anything to him. Yeah. Okay. So I help you figure all that stuff out for your dog. So in my theory of training, I'm as low as possible, but as high as needed. Okay. Uh, you'll read stuff online and it's called the uh, low level e-collar training. Mm -hmm. The issue I have with this method is it's so low, like they're at levels of three to five. Okay. okay? I get maybe one dog a year that's that sensitive. Okay, most dogs fall between 25 to 35. Every now and then we get an outlier. They might be more sensitive or they might be less sensitive and their number might be much higher, okay? I help you figure all that stuff out uh, during the training. Uh, there's a couple of factors. One, we have the, the length of your dog's coat, the density of the coat, the size of your dog. Um, uh, is there any behavioral issue? Like if I have a dog that's reactive because they're under stress or their adrenaline is going, their uh, tolerance to the collar, might be greater okay so all this stuff is stuff that i figure out with you uh during the training so like you show up with your dog you have your equipment your dog is fitted ready to go and i help you figure out when he's feeling the collar okay, okay? so if the collar is too low it'll get the dog's attention but then you're constantly having to use the tool to get the dog's attention okay uh the way that i use it is i'm as low as possible as high as needed where the dog goes you know what i don't like the sensation i want less of it Okay. So if you're always, if you are using this every single day forever, that tells me it's not, it wasn't done correctly. Mm -hmm. At some point, the application of this should go down to where it's like once in a blue moon. But if I tell my dog to heal, my dog just heals. I'm not having to remind them 20 times on a walk that they're supposed to be at my side. Does yeah. that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, um, we, we train with what's called, uh, pressure. Are you familiar with like pressure work? So have you ever pulled up and pushed down on Cricket's butt to make him sit? No? So if you pull up on the leash and you press down on the butt, you put on what we call leash pressure or physical pressure. And the moment the dog sits, everything would stop. Okay? And if the dog got up again, I can pull up and I can press down to reinforce the sitting position. And then the dog starts to learn, hey, every time I break from this position, you reinforce this pressure. And if I just stay seated, nothing happens. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's the same thing with the collar. Okay, so we find a number that Cricket goes, hey, I'm bothered by that. I don't like that. I want less of it, right? And we use that to shape the behaviors. So most people tend to think of e-collar as a punisher. So let's say Cricket knows sit, okay? You say sit and he doesn't do it. And you repeat it and he doesn't do it. And you repeat it again, he doesn't do it. And then you go, you know what? I'm going to punish you now because you ignored me three times. That's how people tend to think of the e-collar, okay? I think of the e-collar as a communicator. So what I do is I reshape everything using the pressure of the collar. So if the dog forgets to sit, if I tap on the collar, the dog goes, oh yeah. And they just give me what I'm looking for, which is the sitting position. Okay. Same thing with like recall. If I call the dog, most people think, oh, you would just call the dog. And if they don't come to you, you would just hit the button. I go, not really. Cause if you did that and the dog was not conditioned to turn off the collar, they need to come to you. If anything, it'll push the dog away from you, okay? So we have to teach the dog when they feel the pressure, when they give the response that we, we're looking for, whether it's the sit, the recall, or the heel or whatever, that once they go into the behavior, the pressure goes away, okay? Do you drive? Mm -hmm. You ever been on the expressway? You ever had someone drive really close behind you? Yeah. It makes you feel a certain way, Yeah. right? And you might speed up, 
you might change lanes, you might not do anything, or you might hit the brakes. You might do one of those four things, right? Or nothing at all. So that's so what we call spatial pressure. They're, they're driving really close to you to make you feel a certain way, to motivate you to do something in response. Whether or not it's what they were looking for is a different thing, Yeah. okay? Growing up, uh, there was peer pressure, right? Kids like trying to uh, pressure you into like doing things that maybe you shouldn't do. Uh, so pressure is all over the place. We just don't really see it that way anymore. Mm -hmm. But dogs live in this world of pressure. So like, if I'm dealing with a dog that has reactivity issues, and they see another dog, that puts them under pressure. They feel uncomfortable. And the closer that dog comes, the greater the pressure they feel, okay? So then, in order for us to correct that behavior, we're technically overriding one stressor with another stressor, which would be the e-collar. And the dog thinks, okay, I know if I act out, the collar will turn on, but I also feel uncomfortable with this dog. Yeah. So what happens if I don't act out, right? Nothing happens with the collar, nothing happens with the dog, and the dog goes, oh, that dog didn't hurt me, and nothing happened with the collar, so I guess I don't need to be reactive, okay? So, dogs live in the world of like body language and physicality. Um, have you ever seen them get nipped at or, or by another dog, or him nip another dog um, during play? Yeah, in play. Okay, so dogs are physical creatures. They nip and bite each other. Uh, they nip and bite each other to correct each other, uh, to show affection, even in play, where they'll grab their skin and kind of pull and stuff. They're very physical creatures. The e-collar allows us to be physical with him without being physical because everything's at the press of a button. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Questions on any of that stuff so far. So when we're layering in the e-collar, the first thing that we always teach uh, is heel, which is um, walking on a leash at your side with no pulling. Uh, the reason why we always start with heel first is most people, uh, the two common things that they struggle with are leash pulling and leash reactivity, okay? Heel resolves both of those problems. It also is a great way to layer in the e-collar because we can layer it in, in a non-confrontational manner, which is walking with the dog, Yeah. right? Uh, most people in the city of Chicago walk their dogs three times a day, seven days a week. So that's three times a day, seven days a week, you get to practice this exercise, okay? So if we get a dog who happens to be like a nervous, anxious, fearful dog, that is who they are. That's their um, genetics. So when we start training with remote collar because it's a stressor, we tend to see incline in that behavior, okay? The dog becomes anxious, nervous, or fearful because that's their stress response and the e-collar is a stressor. Um, so by repeating the exercise and working with them on a regular basis, it teaches them that the e-collar isn't a bad thing, that it's a communicator and it gets them over the stress of it. So typically by the second week, if not the second week, by the third week, they're over the concept of the collar mm -hmm. and then we were building all the other commands on top of that, obedience wise, yeah. okay? So we always cover the heel first uh, heel is typically a two-part exercise. Uh, first class is the first half. Uh, we train here in, in Oz Park. It's very busy here. This is not as busy. It's like 20%. But there's like dogs, baseball games, you know, little uh, things like this. Yeah. Uh, so like if I'm dealing with a client who has a reactive dog, it's nice because if the dog becomes reactive, I walk them through addressing everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they're there with their dog. It's all hands-on for them. I don't need to touch the dog. It's very rare that I have to step in to handle the dog in case like things are going south. Yeah. For the most part, it's all done by the owner. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then when they leave here, they can more easily replicate it because it was all hands on for themselves. It wasn't me doing the training and then going, okay, here you go. Uh, Cause I already did a lot of the work. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, so the first class is always the first half of heel. Second class, you show up, you give me feedback. Uh, we talk about any, you know, progress, things like that, things is that you're struggling for the, with. This is for the boarding too. Oh, you're doing a boarding train? Yeah. Oh, okay, I gotcha. Sorry, I was, I was talking about in person. So you're looking more into a boarding train option. Yeah. Um, any reason why? Um, more so, I'm, I'm good at keeping, I'm good at keeping up with training okay. on a day-to-day, -day, but I don't really have the time right I see. Now sure. Like, all day, every time I'm going out with him. I see. Plans. I'm trying to bring him with me all of the time. I see. And it's just not working because sometimes my attention isn't on it. Uh -huh. And I think it'll be easier for me if he has a foundation and then I can keep up with I him. I see. I got And I'd you. rather do it while he's like it, at a good age to do it. I see. Before he like hits a year. I gotcha. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So your dog. Uh, he's pretty, like he's easy going. I just want to get on it before he gets, while he's like receptive to things. Sure. And, like yeah. start him young. 
Uh, like right now is a good age. Like he's an adolescent right now. He's like a teenager. Yeah. Um. Okay. I know you're bored. So only reason why I ask is um, a lot of people think that it's a lot of work to do the training, mm -hmm. but I was telling you, you just train as you live your life. But if you have like a busy uh, social life or whatever, and it's like, well, I like to train my dog and have him be a part of it, but at the same time, I can't do both, then it makes more sense. Yeah. Uh, okay. He could do a board and train because temperament, he's fine. Mm -hmm. It's just obedience type stuff. Yeah. Uh, when I get clients that have dogs with more behavioral issues, I'll tell them not to just because it's important that they understand and learn how to. To deal with those. Exactly. The behaviors. Yeah. yeah. My last dog was really reactive. So I gotcha. I, I get that. Part. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, pretty simple. So in terms of a board and train, um, so with the layout in one week, we get everything done. Mm -hmm. Sits down, sit, stay down, come play seal. Okay, uh, the six, what I call the six family pet commands. Depending on how far along you want him to uh, be in his training is, is the reasoning for having a longer program, okay? So the first week is what we call foundational. It's all on leash stuff except for the recall that we do the long leash for. And we're, we're, we're laying the foundation for all the, um, all the commands. So I'm uh, reshaping and reteaching everything to the e-collar, okay? If he stayed for a longer duration of time, then I'm building his his obedience to a higher level, moving towards that off leash control. Yeah. Okay. So the second okay. by the second week, we start to transfer and transition all the commands onto the long leash okay. to already start working towards off leash reliability. Okay. So it really comes down to when you pick up your dog, how far along do you want him to be in the training? Okay. The longer we have the dog, the closer he's going to be towards off leash reliability. However, please note that there is always going to be one, some level of regression in training when you pick up your dog. Two, there's still work on your part. Yeah. Okay. The regression is because uh, he's lived the past five, six months with you a certain way. Yeah. We take him. It's boot camp. Yeah. Right. It's very structured. Yeah. We're there to train him. We're not there to cuddle him. So yeah. that's what we're prioritizing. And then he comes back home. Yeah. And he's like, oh. I'm back home again. Yeah. So then a lot of those behaviors or like he's thinking like, oh, like, you know, mom doesn't do this stuff. Only Jesse and his staff does. And yeah. then you have to do the follow up work so that he starts to learn right. like, oh, wait a minute. Like it's the same rules at home, too. Yeah. Yeah. You have to learn how to do it. Correct. Yeah. And then uh, apply everything. Exactly. I think that'll be a lot easier for me. OK. To do it that way. Um, and then with uh, each week that we have the dog, you do get a training video. Okay. okay. So like the first video is always the longest anywhere between an hour and a half to two and a half hours, okay? Because I'm, I'm, I'm teaching everything, I'm explaining everything, okay. okay? The second week, if we had them for longer, is usually around 30, maybe 45 minutes because everything's been taught. Now I'm just explaining to you, this is how, this is the next stage in training. This is how we're advancing his obedience. Um, the third week, we start to work them around, uh, if the dog is social, other dogs. And then by the fourth week, we're starting to work with them towards off leash. Okay, and he's got dogs as a distraction. Yeah. Okay. So the all the videos post the first one are always usually about maybe 30 minutes, 45 minutes at the longest. Mm -hmm. Because it's just, okay, he's no he knows everything now, but these are the steps for you to build them towards that off leash reliability. Yeah. Okay. Um, questions on any of that? No, that's not Um Does he stay like he stays with multiple different people or how does the boarding itself work? So I have a facility that's located uh, just west of the West Loop. That's an 18,000 square foot space. Mm -hmm. um, each dog has a, I think it's a four by six foot kennel. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the day is, it's a ro we do hourly rotations. So for the board and trains, we always prioritize the training first for the first week. And then if the dog is social, we'll start to integrate them into like play groups and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a staff member that lives on premise. So there's always a person around 24 seven in case okay. there's an emergency. And he still gets a lot of exercise. Yeah. So we do. Uh, so with, with the day, um, dogs get around four to six hours of training a day. Okay. okay? Uh, he gets duration work, which is staying still for a period of time. Uh -huh. So like, let's say, are you familiar with place command? Yeah. Like go to your bed, don't move. Yeah. Okay. He doesn't do that. Okay. So that's part <laughs> of the day. I like him to do that. Yes. So with our board and trains, uh, they typically do a long AM session and a long PM session of at least two hours a piece. Okay. So he might do 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. where he's just laying on his bed. There's dogs on treadmills. There's dogs playing. There's dogs being trained. There's a lot of activity going on, but he is required to sit still during all that stuff. Okay. okay? Uh, and then uh, all the handlers um, do a session with the dog a day. 
So after I, so I work with him, I do the video, and then I tell my staff, this dog has now learned heel, start working the dog on heel, okay? okay? So during his stay with us, his training is being reinforced throughout the day. Uh, he will get treadmill time, so he's getting some kind of physical outlet. And then after, the reason why we don't like socializing dogs the first week is they tend to be stressed because it's new environment yeah. and a lot of training, okay? Yeah. So after the first week, they tend to calm down, and we can start integrating them into uh, socialization groups, oh. okay? Uh, questions on any of that? That sounds good. He's social. He used to go to daycare for a little bit. Okay. And he moves through the dog park. Um, how far along are you wanting him to kind of to be with this in his training? I think the third week is sounding good. Okay. Yeah. Um, Yeah, he's frustrated. He like, doesn't know how to sit still for this long. May I? Yeah. Um, yeah, so this here is what we would call overstimulation. It's the brain's inability to relax and settle down. Um, so like my, my consult just before you showed, I could hear the dog barking from like a block away. And I was like, oh, that was my consult because she was a little <laughs> bit late. And then it was the same thing. Her dog was just very overstimulated and didn't know how to relax. Um, he gets nervous in the car, mm -hmm. so when I drive him somewhere, he takes like, he has like a 30 minute recovery period kind of after the car. Mm -hmm. Unless I take him to the dog park and he knows he's going to the dog park, I think he's like unsure about what the room to him is. I see. He's like, where are you taking me? <laughs> sure. So in the car, what's his behavior like? He just, he's, he's fine. He just drools. Okay. Like he sits there and he like, he'll lay down and then he'll get nervous and he'll stand back up again. Okay. And he just seems kind of restless like what he's doing now and sure. he'll get a little drooly. Yeah. So that's most likely, um, uh, does he vomit or no? Um, he has like once or twice. Okay. Uh, are these like on longer trips or short trips? Um. For the vomit? I would say shorter trips. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, so sometimes, uh, some dogs will get motion sickness. Um, if it was, it would be more consistent with the vomiting. It sounds like he's getting anxious in the car. Uh, there is something that we can do to a degree. Uh, but since being in a car is unnatural to a dog, yeah, it's, there's no guarantee that we can stop the anxiety, but there is, there is something that we can do about it. Okay. okay? Uh, in the cases where we've tried to attempt to do training to see if the dog can be more relaxed in the car and it just doesn't work. I know there's like a doggy Dramamine, so if you ever have to do like a longer road trip with yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. I've used uh, that. I've used like something, it's like dog motion sickness. Sure, yeah. 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 I think it just kind of just puts them to sleep or something like that. Yeah. I get it because I, I get car sick if I sit in the back. Sure, <laughs> so yeah. I'm like, you probably feel sick. Yes. So, uh, but yeah, there is some stuff that we can do that can address the car anxiety, as long as it's not motion sickness related, because that's just a, that's a physiological thing, not so much like a behavioral thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, questions on that? No, that sounds good. So, um, for the boarding train, uh, the, the, there's pros and cons, okay? The pro is we get a lot done in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. I always tell people a week of our time is like three weeks of your time. Yeah. Okay? Uh, we cover all the commands within the period. Because, mm -hmm. uh, like, for example, if you did a two-week boarding train, that would be the equivalent of a six-week in-person program. In six weeks, we would cover heel, come, and maybe stationary control, so three commands. Whereas in a two-week program, we cover all the commands, plus we're building it already towards off-leash. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just to give you kind of an idea. Uh, the, the con of a boarding train is that the training is all tied to us, and then we have to, tie, we have to transfer that training over to you. Right. Okay. Now, every dog is different. I, there, uh, my client earlier, she was like, do you ever like have failures? And I go, not for the dog. I was like, I'll get it done for the dog. But I, I have failures with the humans. The humans, yeah. Okay. So and every, all the dog classes I have taken have been like training the humans. Yeah. To train their dogs. dogs are pretty easy. They 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 it's so easy. They they get <laughs> they they give you what you give them essentially. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I doubt this, but just as FYI, if for whatever reason uh, crickets, um, toughness to the collar or sensitivity to the collar was very high, mm -hmm. like he didn't like he just like didn't care. His number could be 90, for example. And then he's like, okay, I'll start doing the stuff. But then when you pick him up and we're going over everything and you're like, what do you mean my dog's number is 90? It's hard for the human to under, to gap or to close that gap. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because they didn't do the training. So in the videos that you get, I work the dog, it's all real time, okay? So for whatever reason, if he is being very uh, resistant to the collar uh, or, or gets stressed, I work the dog through it. 
okay? And you see the process. The reason why this is important is if you pick up your dog and then I'm like, okay, this is what you have to do, right? And then you come back and you're like, yeah, I don't want to do that. Then I go, well, now you've just thrown money out the window because um, if you're not willing to reinforce the training for him, for what he needs, he's not going to listen to you. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. So I doubt it, but I always w want people to understand that uh, they are the biggest or, or the, the how would you say? They're the biggest part of the training. Yeah. Right? Because he's going to live with you the next X amount of years. Yeah. So then if it's like, oh, I feel bad if I have to go to 90 for my dog, I understand that emotionally for the human, but then the dog goes, oh, great, so I don't have to listen to you now because you're not willing to go to where I need you to go right in order to listen it's like you don't have this if you don't have the same boundaries they're just going to break in for you exactly yeah okay um and in the training videos for example let's say i'm working on heel he starts to get stressed anxious nervous or even flighty i always work the dog through it um, i don't stop i don't reset okay reason being life doesn't let you stop and reset if this dog is going to be fully off leash and something were to happen in the environment and it would stress him out if you've never made him push through to fulfill a task or a command, you now have unreliable obedience. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because if he gets flighty, like most people go, so if I'm working with the client real time and the dog starts to get flighty from the collar, like, oh, the collar's making the dog run away. I go, yes, because that's the dog's stress response. They're, 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 uh, they have a flight, strong flight response. And I'll keep working the client through it. And eventually the dog learns, okay, running from this isn't working, but when I walk with my owner, everything goes away. And I go, you have to do that because then if something were to spook your dog, when they're off leash and make them run away, because you've never made them think to themselves running away isn't an option, they're gonna use that option. Yeah. Does that make sense? So I train for reality, I train for life, I train for emergency situations. Uh, most common thing that I've had clients uh, get confronted with is uh, a random firework when they weren't expecting it. So after they're at the park, their dog's off leash running around, some kid blows up a firework, it explodes, dog gets spooked, takes off. Yeah. Okay. In the cases that I've had people tell me this, almost always they're maxed out on the collar, which is 127, mm -hmm. and then continuous. Mm -hmm. So on the e-collar, there's two functions of stimulation. Uh, there's the nick, which is a pre-time sensation. That's it. Okay. So even if you hold the button down, after that initial tap, nothing happens. Right. With continuous, for as long as you hold that button down, the dog is feeling stimulation. Mm -hmm. So if I hold it for five seconds, the dog feels five seconds of stimulation. The moment I release, it stops, uh -huh. okay? And it caps at 12 seconds. So even if I hold it for like 15 seconds, it caps at 12. Yeah. So in those situations, because the dog is in a fear flight mode, running from what they think is danger, the owner had to override the fear flight with a uh, high intensity pressure on the collar to get the dog to be uh, more worried of running away from the owner than they were running from the stressor. Oh, Isn't it? Yeah. So these are the things that I train for. It's rare. Yeah. And in, in, span, in 12 years of training dogs, I've had about five to eight people tell me that they've come across this problem, but they were able to return their dog because they had their e-collar and they, were, they thought on the fly and were able to just max it out and override the situation, mm -hmm. okay? okay? Otherwise, most dogs fall within 25 to 35 in terms of the range for like standard things like this, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, my client earlier today, they have a Weimaraner. Uh, he has very strong prey drive. And at the end of the class, a, a squirrel showed up right on time. And the dog took off after the squirrel and was barking up the tree. And we waited. I said, let him have it. Let him have some fun. And then he was at 25 when we were training. And then they ended up going to 40. And at 40, he finally turned away from the squirrel and then ran towards them. Uh -huh. okay? So e-collar, it's not concrete. It's not like, oh, 25 is my magic number and it always works. It depends on the context. It depends on what your dog is doing. It depends on is, if your dog is under stress, is there an emergency, so on and so forth. Okay. okay. But once you understand it, you don't, I don't even look at the numbers. The numbers I use as a reference for you, so you have a baseline of like, oh, this is what we do in this kind of context. But the dog really tells us everything we need to know. So if I'm working with him at like a 60 and he keeps yelping, then I go, okay, I'm too high in the collar, mm -hmm. right? If I'm operating at 30 and he's not listening, then I go, well, now I'm too low in the collar. I need to be now somewhere in between, okay? Wait, so did the dog, the dog was chasing the squirrel mm -hmm. for fun and they didn't want him to? They just wanted to call him at some point. They just wanted to stop it at a certain time. Yeah. So they were okay with him chasing it to begin with. Okay, so yeah. I was gonna ask you, what do you think about that? Because I let him chase squirrels mm -hmm. for fun 
but I would like to like be able to tell him yeah. this is a time to run around the park and chase them, yep. and this is a time that we're not doing that. That is correct. Okay. That's how it should be. Okay. Okay. So I, I have don't want no him to not be able to do that because I know it's like a it's a primal instinct. Yeah, it's he's a dog. So, yeah. Your dog is a predator. Yeah. Okay. So I have no problems with any of these things. Okay. I just want to make sure that when I say come or give some kind of command, okay. it's the dog is going to perform it, okay. right? So my general rule of thumb is 80% work to 20% play. Mm -hmm. So if I take my dogs out for an hour, for example, 45 minutes or so the dogs would be in a structured heel, 10 to 15 minutes or so would be you're free to be a dog and do what you want, uh -huh. okay? Dogs become what you practice with them. Mm -hmm. So if you practice, like earlier, because you, you're stationary, and there was no clear direction. Mm -hmm. You use the stick to kind of get his attention, but the stick is actually stimulating. Mm -hmm. So then two minutes later, he gets up, he's wanting to do something else. Yeah. I took the leash, I've shortened the leash, and I've just put a little bit of, uh, actually that was pressure, which you saw, mm -hmm. when I was pushing on his butt. And I kept repeating that, and now he's giving me more relaxation. Yeah. Because right now it's like, we're just having conversation, mm -hmm. okay? Now after this, it's like, okay, but go off and explore. Well, I don't care. Yeah. Right? So there is a time and place for a dog to be a dog and for them to be under control, okay? So if I practice more control, when the dog is being a dog and I need them to do something randomly within that time frame, they're more likely to be responsive because they practice more discipline. Right. But what people tend to do is, I let my dog do whatever they want 100% of the time or 99.9% .9 of the time, but there's that 0.01% where I need the dog to listen. I go, that doesn't work that way. Because <laughs> their dog does what they want most of the time. Yeah. So if you're like, hey buddy, get over here. And he's like, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. I want to do this. Yeah. Now my obedience means nothing. Right. Okay. So uh, the, the, the concept or the, the, the reason for having more control is actually they have more freedom. Okay. I don't want a robot. Your dog's not going to lose his personality. Right. He's not going to hate you or, or, or be resentful to you. Dogs don't do that, okay? It's the human just putting on all these emotions. Exactly. He just learns boundaries. Yeah. It's so like right now- He with, does better with boundaries too. Like I feel like he's kind of eager a lot of times mm -hmm. for direction. Because mm -hmm. when he gets aimless, he's like, I don't know what I'm doing with myself. Yeah. He seems like he benefits a lot from like me just telling him how to act in a certain situation. Yes. All, to my, in my opinion, all animals, want some kind of structure yeah okay uh and then so we have leaders and followers most dogs tend to be followers okay uh general rule of thumb in the world actually 80 20 rule 80 percent of people or animals are followers 20 percent are leaders mm -hmm. if everybody was a leader there'd be a lot more conflict yeah okay so there's there's those of us that like structure and implementing structure and there's those of us that need the structure right um if your dog does not have structure he does not know his place in the world Okay, so when you're walking with him and you tell him like he has to walk at your side and all that stuff, he's like, okay, my job is to follow mom. Okay, this also takes off a lot of weight of dogs that have um, reactivity issues. So reactivity, just as an example, if the dog is walking with the owner and doesn't see the owner as a leadership type personality, there always has to be a leader. So the dog goes, well, if you're not gonna do it, I'm gonna do it, Yeah. right? So then now the dog starts to be reactive thinking that other dogs or people may be threats, mm -hmm. but they're not. Right. But if the human steps in and goes, okay, I'm in control now, yeah. technically speaking, um, the safety or well-being of the owner and their dog is now in their hands, and the dog goes, okay, that's not my responsibility, that's your responsibility, so I no longer need to be reactive. Because I was using reactivity as a way of handling this stress uh, or these dogs, because I didn't know how to, I don't know how to, uh, how to say, uh, live in the world like this. Yeah. Okay, because the world's not supposed to be like this. Your dog's not supposed to be on a leash. Yeah. He's not even supposed to look like that. <laughs> you know, this is all stuff that we've created. Yeah, we want them to act a certain way. Exactly. So uh, having that structure takes off a lot of that pressure. Right. Because then they don't feel like they are in charge of, of the safety and well-being of the family. Yeah. Okay. Now sense. here, so this is a little bit of overstimulation. Mm -hmm. Overstimulation is the brain's inability to relax. Mm -hmm. So like that whining. Yeah. Right. The kind of shifting and the getting up and stuff. That's because he's so used to needing to do something. Yeah. Right. But now that I'm countering him and going, we're not doing anything right now, we're going to see a little bit of that habit come back. But I just keep repeating what I'm doing. If I had your dog for two days, you'd have a completely different dog, even without training, just with me handling him. Yeah. Because I'm putting on a lot of boundaries and he's like, okay. He's like, this is now what life is. Yeah. He's so, has kind of, he's definitely like this. He like, 
is used to doing something all of the time or it like he's used to being around a lot of people mm -hmm. and a lot of other dogs for a lot of the day because mm -hmm. i don't i don't work right now mm -hmm. um, so he's kind of always with me but he'll do it at home even if he like gets bored and doesn't have anything to do sure he'll like chase the cat i gotcha so he like distracts himself but then he'll like put the toy down and like kind of get a little whiny and yeah. like walk around and somewhere. no worries yeah that's because um the brain is constantly needing something to do okay and a lot of times uh so is that a puppy thing or is that his personality no it's a lack of boundaries mm. it's a lack of boundaries that he understands mm. okay so you might tell him no, you might say uh-uh, right, or redirect them. Dogs don't really understand that. Let's say he was getting restless with another dog and they didn't like it. What do you think that dog would do to stop him? Yeah. Yes. Physicality. Yeah. Right? Don't do that to me. Yeah. Um, so dogs are physical creatures. They nip and bite each other. And I think I went over that earlier in play and stuff like that. Yeah. So the remote collar allows us to nip and bite a uh, cricket at the press of a button and start to get what he needs uh instinctually mm -hmm. so a lot of the stuff will go away on its own simply through the training mm -hmm. because now he's being nipped and bitten for things and he's being held accountable mm -hmm. or oh, if you don't do this if you don't do that or if you bark at a dog mm -hmm. right now there's consequence so now he starts to go okay i need to learn to have impulse control and self-regulate because if i don't there's now consequence right but so like earlier like with the stick if you use the stick to redirect them he went for, he would, like an example for like reactivity, he goes from like, I'm gonna bark at the dog, it's like, oh, stick. So yeah. now you're just like- He's still up. Exactly. He's like still alert. I mean, exactly. So you've just like band-aided the problem. Yeah. Um, so that's why when we're doing obedience, it's, it's, it comes from a, a place of discipline mm -hmm. and that's what creates the calm passiveness. But he can become excited. People can very easily create the excitement. Anybody can create excitement in a dog. Yeah. Creating calmness in a dog is what's more complicated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? And it, it's fairly simple. Like you have, from what I can see here, a softer dog. Mm. It's not taking me much. No, he's pretty, he's pretty passive. Right. So that's what's allowing me to already start to impact him uh, uh, energy wise. And then the more I, I would, the longer I would have him, the more he starts to unlearn old behaviors and learn new behaviors. Right. Okay. So, but yeah, I see a little bit of overstimulation. So, which is super common nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> My guys used to do that when they were younger. They don't do it anymore. Yeah, so uh, overstimulation, it, if you like did nothing about it, a lot of people think, oh, the dog will outgrow it, right? And I go, no. Yeah. The only way to, to, like, to kind of guarantee that something's going to happen is when you're proactive about addressing the behavior. Otherwise, technically by ignoring, you're allowing. And by allowing, you're reinforcing. Right. Okay. So, uh, does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Question on any of that? Um, no, I think the only question I've thought of so far is, like, if you train them using the e-collar, do you always, like, is he going to have to use it the rest of his Okay, life? yeah. So, uh, is there a point where you can like clean them off? Because I know when you treat, you should use like other kinds of rewards because then they will only start listening to you if they can smell like the treat pouch mm -hmm. in your pocket. Is it the same thing with the collar where if the collar's not sitting on them, then you can't like enforce the same boundaries? Or do they get to the point where it's like enforced and they know it and then you can slowly stop using the collar? Uh so that's mo the, one of the most common questions I get. Uh -huh. It's like a yes or no answer. Uh -huh. Okay, so the easiest way to explain it would be, uh, do you drive? Yeah. Do you go on the expressway? Yeah. Uh, do you go the speed limit? No. Most people don't, right? You see a squad car, what happens? It's okay. When you pass a squad car and it's clear, what happens? And it's clear? Yep. You speed back up. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So think of the e-collar as a cop on the collar. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is that... Um, it has nothing to do with the training methods. Mm. Um, it's what's called opportunistic behavior. Mm. So if the threat of consequence is not around, why do we have to do it? Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So even as humans, we know better, right? We understand like there's a speed limit and all that stuff, yeah. yet we still press the boundaries. Mm. Um, it's, it's, it's an instinctual behavior. All animals do it. So with the remote collar, when you need it, you have it, is what I tell people. 
If he's going to be off leash, you would need it. Yeah. If you're walking with him, you would need it. Reason is outside, you cannot account for life. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's say you're walking with him and then the squirrel just happens to just run across your feet. Mm -hmm. Right. And then he just goes like this because it's so um, sudden mm -hmm. and that you have the ability to bring them back or reel them back in again because you're like, but we're not doing that right now. Mm -hmm. Right. But it was a, it was kind of an off the cuff moment or like, I, you know, because I deal with a lot of reactivity. I, uh, especially in Chicago, a client can turn the corner and just be confronted with a dog right. randomly. Yeah. And if the dog became reactive, they have the ability to stop and correct the behavior. Mm. Uh, but other than that, they're not having to use the tool, yeah. right? If your dog is off leash, going back to earlier when I mentioned the random firework, mm. right? You could be three years into your training, you're like, yeah, he's a great dog. I barely even have to have the collar or use the collar or whatever. And a kid blows up a firework and your dog gets spooked and tries to run away. Well, now I have the ability to return my dog because I had my tool. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So when you have it, you need it is what I explain to people. Uh, the other thing is in order to get to that level of reliability from the dog, like you're training a lot. Right. So like my pit bull Lexi, off collar, she's about 80% reliable. Okay. Okay. She might press boundaries. She might uh, not listen instantaneously, but she will listen. Mm -hmm. Okay. With the collar on, it's 100%. Yeah. And I don't even have to press the button because she knows there's consequence. Right. And I got her at three months and the first, up until she was two years old, those first two years of her life with me, mm -hmm. every day, every interaction, everything was training mm -hmm. because I'm a trainer, you know? So I would have, in the beginning, it was positive only. She was on her general leader. She, I used to work at PetSmart. So she'd go to PetSmart with me and I would be stacking the shelf mm -hmm. and then she'd be waiting there and I would reward her. Like literally the entire shift was All training. Day. Yeah. So it's second nature to her. If I walk with her, she defaults to my side in the heel. Technically, she's not in the heel because I didn't say it. She just defaults because it's such a rehearsed behavior, mm -hmm. right? She's 13 years old now yeah. and, and she's retired. I don't, I don't do as much with her anymore. <laughs> but, but she's that reliable because I put in so much training those first two years, right? right? Most people don't do that, right. okay? So most people are like, I want to get a reliable dog mm -hmm. without having to become a dog trainer myself. Um, yeah. and have to learn all these skills. I just want to learn enough that it'll get me what I want and I can do what I want with my dog without putting a ton of work into it. Okay. And remote collar does allow for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm a, I'm very much a rather have it and not need it type of person. Mm -hmm. And it's something good or bad. Uh, if you're in a yard in a controlled context, I don't care. Yeah. If you're at the park like this and it's open, I would advise I'd have that collar on. Yeah. Cause what if an off leash dog comes? So here's an example. At a client, she was here at this park playing fetch with her dog, mm. just by herself. Mm. Okay, some guy invited himself with his lab to play with them. Yeah, her dog and the lab went at the same time for the ball. Mm. They got in a dog fight. Mm. Okay, she had to 127 continuous her dog to pull her out. Mm. Nothing happened. No one got hurt. Right? She called me up. She was crying. She felt bad because her dog had yelped at one max power. Yeah. And she's like, I don't know that I screwed my dog up. Please, you know, let me know if I have to do anything. And I said, You're perfectly fine. Uh, I said that was a uh, emergency situation and like you did the correct thing because if you would have tried to jump into the fight yourself you may have gotten bitten, bitten the guy would have gotten bitten because yeah. of the frenzy mm -hmm. I was like you just thought on the fly you made it happen yeah your dog yipped and uh, came back to you but you could have not done anything and the fight could have been a lot worse yeah they would have been like wounded exactly so my window of experience is much greater than most people because I hear a lot of stories, mm. right, from clients and stuff. Like I had a client had her dog at the dog beach, like Montrose, and I get, the, I guess there was like a dip in the fence, and her dog r ran to the dip, jumped over the fence, and then ran out. And she had to like run through the park, jump the fence, and chase to get her dog, mm. right? And she's like, "Yeah, that's never gonna happen again. I'm e collar training this dog and never taking it off," you know. Yeah. So it really just comes down to your personal experience or like what you've seen, because people tend to go by the window of what they've seen with their dog, yeah. and they don't expect it. Um, but yeah, that's the way I look at it is if it's, and can you take your dog on a walk without the collar on? Absolutely. Yeah. But he's probably going to speed. Yeah. Right. Cause he's like, okay. And then you can go back to like the redirection or what have you, but then he's going to start learning that mm -hmm. and then, oh, mom's now not always reinforcing the training. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So then what I tell clients then is if they walk their dog, I go, whatever you do, don't say heel, because if you can't reinforce the heel and the dog starts to press the boundary, now the dog is learning heel. Exactly. So if you go out with this equipment, you don't say heel, not a problem. Mm. Yeah, he'll press the boundaries and stuff and he'll do what he normally does. Yeah. But you're not tying an association of when I say this word, sometimes it's reinforced. Sometimes yeah, yeah. It's not. You'd yeah. rather have it be consistent. Exactly. Yeah. So it actually, you have 
and I hate the word gray area, but you have a technically a gray area. Because as long as you're not using the word in a, in, a, in a time where you can't reinforce it, you're not disempowering it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if my mom was like, Jesse, don't do that. Growing up, it, just don't, it was just don't do that. But then I got spanked for the first time. Mm. I was raised old school. So then don't do that had a totally different meaning, right? Yeah. So then when I would be at the store, because I knew my mom couldn't spank me at the store, I would start to press boundaries. Mm -hmm. And then she was like, just wait till we get home. And then when we got home, I got spanked. <laughs> so now I was like, all right, well, now I can't act up at the store knowing that my mom oh, can't spank me at the store. It's still going to happen. Yeah. But I have, as a kid, as a person, you have the, you have that kind of foresight and you can tie those things together. Dogs don't do that. Yeah. Like you can't be like, all right, wait till we get home. Yeah, yeah and then, not going to know either. Exactly. But yeah. <laughs> So it's a great question, the most common question that I get. If you're following the training correctly uh, and the instructions that you're giving and stuff, the application is like once in a blue moon. Mm -hmm. It's simply there when you need it, if you should need it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the beginning, you'll be using it because you're transferring all the stuff that he's learned over to you so that he understands, oh, when mom says come, if I don't do it, she also can press the button, mm -hmm. right? And then once he learns that, he's like, oh, okay, mom is just as strict as Jesse is. He's just as strict. She's just as strict as his staff is, right? Um, he starts to tie it together, together, and then you start to find yourself using it less and less and less. Mm -hmm. Okay. Questions on, uh, on that? No, that makes sense. Do, uh, they, do they like feel aware that you're pressing a button? No. They can <laughs> tie together. Like you're not touching them, so I guess it would. Yeah, be they can tie together that the remote okay. has something to do with the collar. They cannot tie together that it's you manipulating the remote. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, other questions. I'm trying to think here if there's anything else. Uh, it's pretty much it. The one thing I am worried about is him being gone for three weeks. You're welcome to come see your dog. Okay. <laughs> so other training programs will say like, oh, you can't like only after the training because you'll mess up the training. That's nonsense. Yeah. You're welcome to visit them. Okay. okay. Uh, all we ask is that you uh, email us to set up a time yeah. because we okay. do have other dogs in our care. Yep. Yeah. Uh, now, if you do come to visit him during the, during the, the training, right? Um, Act, expect him to act like he hasn't learned anything because you will have there. to yeah. you have to um, do the start implementing stuff mm -hmm. okay so once you watch their videos and then you're implementing the training yourself you're gonna start to see all the work that we put into him kick in mm -hmm. okay because sometimes people they'll come and pick up their dog they're like oh Jesse my dog pulled me and I go yeah because we've not done any transference with you yet yeah okay so how does the pickup go like do you do, do you do training before I take him home so what I recommend to get the most out of your training, and you're welcome to schedule a, a follow-up on the pickup if I'm available, is you get your videos, you watch your videos, okay? So I try to get them to you. So the first video, I try to get to you within three to five days of the first week being there, okay? And then at the start of the second week, you get your second video. At the start of the third week, you get your third video. So you already have access to everything. You pick up your dog and you start implementing what you've learned from the videos, okay? You take a couple weeks and then you schedule your first follow-up. I feel is the best way to get the most out of your program because uh, you're implementing, you're trying it out, you're like, okay, this makes sense. And then you're like, okay, I'm struggling with this. So by the time you come back for that first lesson on that, after picking them up for a couple of weeks, you have two weeks of experience and questions. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the follow-up lesson, if you do it on the pickup, I'm pretty much just telling you the stuff that's in the videos. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you're welcome to do that. I don't have a problem with it. Okay. Uh, but a lot of people just do complete the program wait a couple of weeks, practice it, then have the first class. And then you have the classes there when you need them, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, you can also use the classes to cover stuff that we've not covered during the boarding train. Mm -hmm. If something were to happen, like let's say one day he like started to resource card a, a, a ball or something, and you're like, oh, I've never seen that before, mm -hmm. okay? And you call us up, you're like, hey, I have these follow-ups, can Jesse help me work on this resource guarding? Oh yeah. We oh, just so do. the follow-ups are included with the Yes. Okay. Yes. So with the boarding train, you get private in person as well. Got it. Okay. okay. They're not separate of each other. Got it. Other other places like so you can you can choose where you apply them, kind of thing. Yes. Okay. Got it. So they don't expire. Mm -hmm. They're there. They don't have any monetary value because sometimes clients like, oh, can I like convert my follow ups into like credits for boarding and stuff? I'm like, no, because we already did all the work. Yeah. It, they're just there in case you need them, but you're welcome to use them at any point. Mm -hmm. Um. So then, uh, the, 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 the other places. Like I had a client who did a four week board and train and all they got was 30 minutes of follow up. Mm -hmm. And every other follow up after that was, was, there was a fee. And for us, I'm like, Jesus, I'm like, that's dumb. Cause in four weeks, there's a ton of stuff being covered. 
for, yeah. for in our for our program, you get eight hours of follow up uh -huh. training. So that's eight lessons yeah. because it is so much stuff to cover. Yeah, that's so. like training the dog without training the human. I feel like. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so you get your follow, you get your training videos for one, so that you can see how your dog is learning. Because I think it's very important that you understand how your dog responds to the collar initially. Is it? What do you? What are the videos that you like specifically send? You said it's once a week. Yes. You send a video. Yes. Like what is? What would that video? Be? So like the first lesson of heel, uh -huh. right? Uh, I'm explaining everything. Okay. The second part of it. It's like a breakdown. Yes. Of the process. But it's but it's the learning process. Yeah, yeah. So it's the first time I work with your dog. Oh, okay. Yes. So because his introduction. Okay. Yes. Okay. So like, let's say he became very flighty. Uh -huh. I would work him through it. That would be a part of the video, because it's very important that you understand that. And then you would explain it. Yes. Afterwards. Okay. Yes. Afterwards, endearing. Okay. okay. And then, because going back to earlier, if I don't work your dog through flightiness or whatever response there is we have unreliable obedience okay now i'm not trying to be mean to your dog but we do need to um push through it otherwise if you come across that very issue he's not going to do it because i didn't make him do it yeah and it's going to be hard for you to address because it was never made he was never made to break through it in the first place mm -hmm. okay so now, now it's more work for the future yeah um other questions uh, so if i do the three weeks what what was the like the progression. the progression of the it. first week is uh, what we call a uh, foundational on leash with the exception of recall that's going to be on a longer leash mm -hmm. so it's all those short leash commands sit stay down place heel and it's place like until release correct and wait until it release and that kind of thing correct. or is it just place and stay so sit down in place sit down place yes or all stationary commands okay place is the most lenient mm -hmm. because it sits stand lay down i don't care just don't get off yeah, yeah okay sit like this is more strict sit and only sit down more strict down and only down okay and the way that i use stay is different than most trainers and people uh in the heel we have an auto sit okay so heel means walk with me stay with me sit when i stop so if i come to a stop if a dog is in a heel they'll automatically sit mm -hmm. if i begin moving they would walk with me if i stop they would automatically sit so the dog is in a sitting position, but in a heel command. So if I were to move again, they would expect to move with me. Right. Okay. So if I decide I'm going to move, you're not going to move. I say stay to help the dog differentiate. I'm going to stay in the sitting position and you're going to move away from me. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't do stay like, like stay here in like, like down stay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Down sit in place. All have implied stay. Place would be like, go relax. to your bed. And yeah. Stay there. Yeah. Yeah. Or if like you went to a restaurant. An extended amount of time. Well, down and place can both be extended. Yeah. So down, a dog can lay down for as long as you want them to. It's just a matter of um, reinforcing it. Uh, the one I typically press for extent for extended stays is the place command, because most people feel bad about keeping their dog in an extended down. They like having they like the dog having options in case they want to adjust. Oh, okay. And it's also easier to reinforce. Yeah. Because it's I don't care what you do, just don't get off. Okay. Other questions? Um, no. Why is he so whiny? Why because so I'm because I'm not letting him do what he wants to Why do. Why are you whiny? Uh, and a lot of the stuff will go away as well. Because all this is the overstimulation. You got no patience. Um. Anything else? Um. No, I don't think so. Did you watch any of our training videos? A couple. Um, did you watch the one with like the Pitbull? Yeah. The reactive Pitbull Lake? Oh, no. So if you go to my website, canineperspective.com, it'll have a breakdown of the prices and what the programs include for the board and trains. Uh, but on the homepage, if you go scroll up a little bit, you'll see a YouTube video with the Pitbull kind of smiling in the sun. Uh, it's a great video to watch. That one's behavior. But I break down the process of the e-collar and I take a lesson and I, and I kind of chop it up and I give the example, visual examples and then I explain like uh, what's going on uh -huh. just so you can get a concept of what the training would look like. Yeah. Okay. Because okay. I think it's very important that just people understand the stuff. I'm very transparent with everything. Yeah. Um, uh, every, it's super rare, but like we had a client, uh, they rescued their dog from like Nicaragua or something. Mm -hmm. Like they were out of the country. They brought the dog back and when they tried to train the dog initially with another trainer, the dog would literally scream. Okay, it sounded terrible. Yeah. So I told it in the console, I said, I'm going to have to work through that problem. 
I was like, because it was never addressed. You never worked it off through it with your first trainer. So then they did a, they did a, a board and train and th it sounded terrible because yeah. this dog was like essentially a feral dog. Yeah. Okay. So then I told her, I'm like, I, we need this that guy to stay for longer. Uh, it was a week more and I wasn't going to charge her for it. I just wanted more time to work with the dog because he was very, he was being very difficult. Yeah. And then she's like, well, can you show me uh, uh, the video or whatever? I said, sure. Like, here's the first lesson. Right. And she's like, oh, like, I don't know how I feel about this, this and that. And I was like, you know, I did explain this to you during the consultation that, you know, your first trainer, you had the same issue and you didn't work through it. And now I'm having the same issue and you're giving me the same problem of not wanting to work through it. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. You're like, well, the other option is not. Yes. So, so I was like, just take your dog and go because I'm not going to, I know this is going to be a problem in the future. Right. Um, the dog is never the problem. It's just whether or not the human wants to reinforce in that case like i knew up front it was going to happen because her first trainer had the problem and then she's like oh yeah it'll be fine and then it wasn't fine so then i'm like well now you just wasted a time sl a boarding slot for me yeah because we could have booked somebody else during that time or whatever yeah so um but that's a that was a very kind of extreme rare behavioral case uh, most dogs are pretty straightforward okay anything else i think he's pretty straightforward i mean he's been pretty easy to train yeah He's just, he's, he's a little whiny. Yeah. <laughs> he's just spoiled is the problem. <laughs> We're going to have to unspoil him. Yeah. And it's not that he can't have his freedoms and his... Um... Yeah. I mean, that's why I want to train him is because I'm like really uncomfortable with going to the park and letting him off. Mm -hmm. Even just to play that. Sure. Even if I know he's going to pay attention to me, sure. I feel like I get nervous. Sure. What are you doing? Don't jump. He... Uh, Oh, I did think of something. He uh, he doesn't like when people come into my apartment. Oh, okay. He's not super reactive. Like, he's not aggressive by any means, but he barks at them. Uh -huh. And I think it takes him a little bit to feel comfortable with someone sure. in the house. It takes, like, at least 30 minutes of just kind of ignoring him mm -hmm. for him to, like... Relax. Relax and, like, want attention from that person. Sure. Um, so I would like him to have manners and not jump. He jumps on me when I come home and I've been trying to get him. That's to... easy. Um, are you in the city? Yeah. Uh, so that would be like an in-home mm -hmm. and there's just a $50 upcharge mm -hmm. for the in-homes and you can apply that to any one of your follow-ups. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, that would be something that we wouldn't, there's stuff that we would cover in the training that will help. Oh, that'll, uh, we'll cover in the training that'll help um but we can't recreate like walking into a front door and him being like uh yeah when it's like his front door yeah um but that is something that we can work on in an in-home session okay okay I, I do it all the time okay uh other questions <laughs> no are you being naughty <laughs> uh i'll give him back to you now um what, what the next the, step yeah i guess um, so Tina will most likely put you in touch with uh, Elizabeth or Maria. They handle all the boarding trains at the facility. Okay. And then when you want to book your follow-ups, because those are my in-persons, you would then go to Tina to schedule those. Okay. So um, we'll need a clear fecal. Uh, so if you go to the vet, take a stool sample and say, I need a fecal for a daycare or whatever. He has one from, like, how long ago could it be from? I had to talk to Elizabeth because it's been a long time since I've done that. I think it has to be within the past two to three months. No, we actually need a recent one, recent one. Okay. Because we used to give people a window and say, like, as long as it's been with the past three months, we're fine. Yeah. And then we had someone who did that, and then when they dropped their dog off, they had worms. Okay. So then we need a, we need a clear one. Uh, ever since that, we're like, yeah, we should probably just do it every time. Okay. Um, and then his vaccination records. Mm -hmm. um, and you feed him the chain food. Correct. Okay. Yep. You just drop off food. Yes. And then, um, and if there's any feeding instructions or medications, you just provide us with the instructions. We'll take care of the rest. Okay. And then, um, uh, either Elizabeth or Maria will help you find a time slot that works for your boarding train. Mm -hmm. And then, um, if you ever want to visit them to say hi, make sure that he's doing well and all that stuff. You're more than welcome to just let us know, and we'll they'll schedule that for you as well. Okay. Um, uh, Is there any? I feed him. I feed him a mix of like dry food and also. 
What are you doing? I feed him dry food and raw food. Uh huh. Um, Not a problem. I wouldn't drop. I don't think I would drop them off with raw food just because I like prepare it. <laughs> sure. And it's just kind of a lot of work. So um, you can do a couple of things. Hey, stop it. One would be, um, you're more than welcome to just bring them in kibble, with kibble. Yeah. Uh, I'd we, be able to do that and like some frozen like beef bones that can just be like handed to him. Oh, like the chew on and stuff? Yeah. Sure. That's not a problem. Okay. Uh, Elizabeth will fall, will fill you in. Um, I'm not sure for the longer programs because typically when the dog boards, we have the clients bag all their meals individually. Okay. So that this way we don't, we don't lose like scoops or anything. Yeah. Um, plus when you're feeding 50 dogs a night in the morning, uh, it's a lot to like have to scoop everything. Yeah. So, uh, typically, so we even had clients who do, um, who do raw as well and they just pre-bag everything oh, okay. and that works too. So you just, you can keep it frozen or refrigerated. Yes. Okay. Yes. It's all we care about is that it's portioned okay. so that we can just take it, pop it in the bag and then, and then feed it to your dog is all we care about. Other questions? Um, no, I don't think so. Yeah, he's getting restless. He's so restless. What's going on? If there's anything that you may have forgotten to ask, you can ask Tina. Okay. If they pertain to me, I'll email her and send her the answer. Okay. Otherwise, um, uh, she'll most likely put you in contact with my staff at the facility to get the process rolling. Okay, so okay. she'll email me. Yes. Oh. Okay. Anything okay. else? No, that sounds good. Alrighty, it was a pleasure meeting you. And if you have any questions, you let us know. Appreciate Take it. Take care. Thank you.